Thank you. My wife is, uh, comes from a place, how far is Culture Mile from Castle Bar? About 10 miles. About 10 miles away from where she's from, isn't it? Isn't life funny like that? Yeah. <laughs> not, not me, I didn't. I, I didn't. No, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I, I'm David, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to take you through our story and see what learning points we can bring out of that. Um, and it's always a difficult one to know where to start. Um, but when it comes to babies, uh, I usually start by saying that I had sex. Um, <laughs> it was with my wife. And in my head, I like to think I was pretty magnificent. Um, it's kind of hard to quantify, as there's been no peer-reviewed study, and my wife still refuses to fill in the evaluation forms I keep giving her. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, so I make those assumptions based on uh, my own head. Um, so what happened then was uh, we got pregnant, because it turns out that my wife and I, in combination, are incredibly fecund. I love that word. Um, we're incredibly fecund. So essentially, uh, we look in the diary, have sex once a year, and then get pregnant. Um, uh, and I'm waiting for all my children to figure out that their births correspond to our wedding anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we got pregnant with our first child, and we had this fantastic pregnancy. It was textbook, it was great. Um, and uh, she was actually 42 plus 4. Um, we had a doctor, I, I wasn't there, I was <coughs> working. I actually turned up at the hospital with makeup and glitter on my face because I was doing a, a thing about a vampire in a fight club. Anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, so it turned up, apparently the doctor had sat my wife down and said, if you don't get an induction, you will kill your child. Um, that turns out, it's, it's nonsense because today that child walked into the front room I was like, Alana, where's, where's Alana? I'm sure she was in here. Turns out, uh, and I heard this voice go, hello, daddy. And uh, she's crouched, not sat, she's crouched on top of the door. So she's the most vital child I've ever met. So what my wife did, instead of saying, am I allowed not to have an induction? She said, um, well, see, you've told me the risks of not being induced. What are the risks of induction? Because I know that there's not a medical procedure in the world that doesn't have attendant risks. If you can't present yourself in a scientific manner, I'm going home. And she did. And she goes, I'll come in and I'll be monitored every day um, if you want me to. But I'm going home. And we ended up having a water birth at home. Um, my point being, uh, choice. Informed choice. You know, give us information. Let us make our decisions rather than feeding, rather than pushing us towards your decision <coughs> based on fear. Um, so anyway, we had, we had that child. And she was incredibly tiring um, and so we had sex again because you know it's all right uh, um, and we got pregnant again and again we had this fantastic pregnancy and you know those families you see <laughs> you see them on Facebook and Instagram and they're taking these pictures and they're all smiling and they're doing stuff and you think they look like the perfect family and of course there's nothing wrong with their lives all you can think is Oh. Um, do you know what? I just want to say, no one, I, I've been doing, uh, talking about baby loss for four and a half years now, and no one in baby loss talks swore until McCohen and Heidi came along. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, um, You're the, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so we, that was us. We had this, because we had this day, this perfect, perfect day. Um, and uh, it was it's brilliant, we had a great time, and we came home, we watched, uh, uh, we did bedtime ballet with my daughter, it's fantastic, she went to bed, we watched a movie, we went to bed, we had great sex, <laughs> vigorous. Um, <laughs> um, as I recall by the neighbours' complaints. Um, the, uh, what happened next? Oh, that's not important. Um, I woke up in the morning, and my wife wasn't there. There was, however, a wet patch in the bed, which has nothing to do with the sex. Apparently, her waters had broken. Um, you know. Um, so, <laughs> uh, um, so my wife's waters had broken. She'd gone downstairs. And you know, when, you, when your waters have broken and you've got mild contractions, what else are you going to do but the ironing? And maybe watch a movie. And that's what she was doing. So we called the midwife. Um, three hours later, the midwife came. So everything's fine. We've done this before. We've been there. We've got experience. Midwife comes along. And um, I just remember, I'm dressing my daughter. 
and the midwife's got her on the so it's been three hours between the waters breaking midwife arriving midwife has her on the sofa is going to start looking for a heartbeat and um uh i went into movie time it's what i call movie time so you know uh, they do this dramatic thing in movies where uh um it fades <coughs> to black and they've got the music going and it fades to black and then the scene comes up and it's moved on a little bit and they fade to black and then it's moved on a little bit and it fades to black and they kind of build up. Wow! <laughs> Bless you, I meant to say. Um, <laughs> um, did, did that hurt? Or is that <laughs> um, I've done a clue. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so it was, <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, so you've got that dramatic tension building up. And the reason I mention that is because in my head, I went into movie time. And this is genuinely how I remember that time. I'm doing up my daughter's uh, uh, buttons, and I suddenly become aware that the midwife has been looking for an extraordinarily long time. Fade to black. I'm in the kitchen, pushing my daughter towards our au pair, because we're like that, we've got an au pair. Um, French, don't you know? Um, Pushing towards, towards the au pair, fade to black. I'm back in the front room and the midwife is saying, sometimes baby hide, babies hide, but maybe we should just go to the hospital to get a scan just in case. Fade to black. I'm driving um, uh, to the hospital. Ten minutes tops to the hospital. Feels like the longest journey of my life. Fade to black. <coughs> I'm in the room with a sonographer. And she's scanning. And I'm looking at the screen. And for the first time in two pregnancies, the screen looks really still. And then she says these words. I'm sorry. And the truth is, we all know, before the words come out, what words are going to come out. We can see it on the face of anyone doing that test. And then my wife makes this noise. And I don't know how to describe what that noise is because it's not a noise any human is meant to make. And it's a scream beyond that which is normal. It's, it's pure despair. And uh, they couldn't find the heartbeat. At that point, I'm like, well, that's it. We go home, we sort it out, we deal with it. Because logic has abandoned me. And it hasn't occurred to me that we've still got to go through birth. We've been hit. What do you mean we've got to go through birth? And I have no recollection of seeing the consultant. My wife actually told me about this a few months ago. And I was like, really? I do remember talking to someone and saying we have to consider the options. And I'm like, what options? The baby's dead. The decision we came to was that my wife tends to labour very slowly and steadily with our first child, the contractions for the whole way along, never got close, closer than five uh, minutes apart, the whole way through right to the end. And the thought of labouring, which had already started uh, uh, that slowly uh, with a dead child, was not something she wanted. So we agreed to augment the labour. Um, and then we met, actually what I, I did, what I did wanted to show you was this. Not that. It was this. Uh, most people have all sorts of media, you know, videos or recordings of their children. Kind of all we've got to prove her vitality. Oop. Is this, which you can't hear. But that's okay. It was basically her heartbeat. And it was strong and it was vital and it was beautiful. Um, yeah, so we were there, faced with this news, and then we met this midwife called Kat, and this is the truth, and people have touched on this already, and I'm just going to hammer it home, but you people, in fact anyone that deals with people on a face-to-face -face basis, will live in our hearts forever, for one of two reasons, one, because you are amazing, and two, because you're shit. <laughs> now, unfortunately, there is no in-between. As a health worker, you cannot be okay. 
You're either good or you're not. And Chris's slides showed it so clearly. And Nicole said it. Everyone who's been up here said it. If you proceed with kindness and compassion and humanity, you will be in the former ca category. If you really don't care that much, go find another job. Mistakes we can deal with because mistakes can be remedied. And what most parents in our position want <laughs> is not blame, but the reassurance it won't happen again and that people have learnt because bear me up every time we hear another story, our hearts break anew. And we're kind of tired of it. And we met this midwife called Kat. Do you know what Kat did? This most amazing, incredible thing. She read our notes. <laughs> And in our notes, it said we wanted a water birth. And Chris had another slide, which was a, you know, get away, what was it? It was a get away from, this has always been done, thank you, always been done this way. Um, because uh, she said, we've never done this before with a stillbirth, but if the pool is free, I'm going to stick my neck out and see if we can get it. I'm going to stick my neck out and see if we can get it. We said, that would be lovely. We went home. And we entered this place, uh, um, and I got the term from, um, what's your name? St <laughs> Steph. Um, <laughs> and, sorry. It's not, I forget my daughter's names, if that helps. Um, and Chris alluded to it as well. Oh, that's not, right. okay, it's gone. Um, we enter this place we call The Void. And it is this place where you are <coughs> sent home. Your world has just changed dramatically and you're sent home to be normal for a couple of days. For us, we were lucky it was a couple of hours. And we had to go home and I thought, you know, well, I, I, I know how to support a woman in childbirth. I know I'll need my energy, so I'm going to eat some food. And I got halfway through my plate and I thought, one more footful and I will vomit. And I looked at my wife and I'm like, she's sitting there with the corpse of a child in her womb. And women have to go home and do that for two days. We all know the best way to give birth is to be relaxed of mind and body and with strength and be serene as you can be. How are you meant to do that when you are carrying a corpse inside you? And we send women home with no preparation to, uh, to navigate the void. And I don't know what the answer is. And I'm actually in the new year going to try and explore that a bit more. But right now, I don't, all I want to do is to put in your heads, what is there that you could possibly do to send your women home with a bit of preparation, physically, uh, mentally? I don't know. I'm just going to put it in your heads because I'm a bit lost. Um, we came back... Um, uh, we came back to the hospital and we got a lovely suite uh, with a thingy, a ball and an exercise bar or something um, and, and a pool and it was lovely. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Um, uh, and it was fantastic. And the midwife, see, this is interesting. We have got nothing but praise for our treatment and the midwives in that hospital. But when we sit in our support group, not a single other person has. So there is something about the individual midwives you get, and there's your responsibility to be the best you can be. Um, uh, but the midwives, we know, they, was, they were amazing. They came in that room with us, and there was laughter in that room, and chat in that room, and as, as, long as, as well as tears. And somehow they were with us when we needed them to be, and they were away when we needed our time to talk or to cry. It's like they just knew, and we had a friend who was a doula, and she came, and she was with us as well. And thank God for them all, because uh, apparently, I don't, I don't remember this, but they told us afterwards that a consultant, there was a butterfly on the door. And this consultant barged and said, right, what's going on here then? And apparently the lead midwife and the doula both went. So, yeah, and there we were in that room. Now, uh, I, this is my personal feeling. Having seen the difference between a normal physiological birth and a, an, an induced birth, an augmented birth, my thing is, if you need an induction, you have an induction. If you don't need one, why would you? Because to me, the difference is horrible. And just watching it as a man is horrible. And actually, can I just talk a little bit about supporting a woman as a man? Because I get really annoyed. Because what happens is, as a man, you, <laughs> you go, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's like men just seem to be a bit of a joke when it comes to birth. Because uh, you go, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. How was the birth? Oh, you know, it was, it was, it was hard going. 
Who are going? What did you do? <laughs> I didn't give birth. Now, I know how much I didn't bloody do because I was there not bloody doing it. I was there supporting my wife as best as I could to the best of my ability with all my strength and it was frustrating as all hell that I could not do more. So don't have a go at me for being a man um, while in the, same, in the other breath expecting men to stand up. It doesn't work both ways. You can't do it both ways. I have to get off my chest. I'm feeling better now. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, so, yeah, so there we were and uh, supporting my wife. She was doing this and this is just I just have to say this every time this is the woman this is the woman that gave birth to my daughter and in the middle of this horrible contractions she looks at me and she says I know this child is gone but I intend to bring her into the world I didn't know it was a girl at that point I intend to bring it into the world with all the grace and dignity it deserves and if it's a girl grace should be her name and I looked at her with just wonder that she could find this place in her. And she looked at me and said, if that's all right with you. And I'm like, seriously, <laughs> come on, come on. Um, and she went on to give birth to Grace, who was beautiful and perfect in every way except for breath. And... This is the whole thing we've been talking about, about normalising, when all choice has been gone away. There shouldn't, uh, no parent should ever have to say, am I allowed to at this point? It should be obvious. Let's do the normal stuff. Do you, do you want to cut the cord? Yeah, because that's, that's what I'd do anyway. So why not cut the cord? Do you want to skin to skin? Well, yeah, because that's what I do anyway. When we have lost all choice, when we have lost all normalisation, when we've lost all power, help us gain a modicum of it back and you start to mitigate the level of trauma that we will feel as we go through our journey. And my wife held her skin to skin and then I cut the cord and she passed it to me and at that point it was the worst because it felt like this cosmic prank was being played on me because she was still warm for her mother and I had a moment of thinking it's just a joke she's actually alive and I asked her to breathe and I asked her to open her eyes and of course she didn't do either. And the words for the song, A Beautiful Dreamer, that Bing Crosby sang, came to me and I sang that to her. And uh, then I had two, um, uh, my wife had problems with a retained placenta. Uh, so I was left to dress my daughter. I wish I'd bathed her. Didn't know that was an option. I wish I had. Um, Siobhan, my wife, wishes she'd seen her bum. So her baby's bums. Um, She's never seen her bum. Um, so I dressed her, and then there's my first dilemma, um, which no one really noticed I was in, was do you put a nappy on a dead baby? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, but dead baby doesn't need a nappy, but it's a baby, how can you dress it without a nappy? So in the end, I figured out, maybe I'm gonna go for a nappy, I don't care, and I dressed her, and I put her in a cold cot, and thank God that our trust had one, and it is anathema to me, anathema to me that in 2019, there are trusts without cuddle cots, without cold cots, and without bereavement suites in what we like to call a first world country. I'm sorry. And those that do have to rely on the work of charities for that. I don't understand. Um, so I had her in the cold cot and I had to put her in the corner because my wife needed me. And what that meant was I had to turn away and leave my daughter in the corner. To this day, whenever I have to turn away from my children and leave them, I kind of flash back to that, if not, phys if not uh, mentally, then emotionally. Do you know how often that happens? Every bedtime. Five and a half years of bedtimes. Every time I visit the grave, I have to turn away from my children. And the thing about people in our position, we all know that anything can happen, but we know anything can happen. And every night I turn away and I hope they'll be there in the morning. And I'm always tempted, I'll get a mirror and do the vampire test, see if there's any breath. Um, always tempted. And once upon a time, I used to leave the house and go, I'm going, and now I can't do that. I have to kiss them goodbye because I'm not sure I might come back and have all the, you know, and they need to have a last memory. This is where we've gone. If, um, um, yeah, um, sorry, I was considering what to do next. Um, and so I had to leave her in a corner. Uh, and that resonates with me forever. In fact, in fact, this is the time, this is the time. Uh, can, I ha can I have a volunteer? 
No, no, I'm serious. No, oh, no, we got, got yeah, come down, no, come down, come on. It's Sneezy Girl. <laughs> What's your name? Grace. Grace. <laughs> See, has anyone seen Batman versus Superman? Oh, never mind then. Um, Grace, how kinky are you? <laughs> I like her. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to explore your sensory deprivation kink. Um, so do you, you want to actually put those on so that you're comfortable? Oh, you might need to put these on first because, yeah, put the blindfold. <laughs> I was rubbish at maths. <laughs> is that maths? Might be, yeah. Right, so here's the headphones. There we go. I'm just going to get the cord so you don't trip over it. I'm just going up, here you go, and you can put that in your hand, lovely, I'm just going to move you here, I'm just going to, trust me, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> I'm just going to spin you three times because that's helpful, um, excellent, now I need another volunteer, you, just want, you don't have to leave your seat, it'd be great if it's someone near the back, oh, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> right, so what I need you to do is, so, so Grace, you are going to walk in the shape of a star, so you're basically going to trace out a star on the floor, how you walk. You, you've got to die, you don't know where your left and right is, do you? Um, you have just got to describe to her, you know, which way to walk. Your main job is to keep her safe. Um, so, off you go. In a star. What? In a star shape. In a star shape, it's got to walk in a star shape, um, it's all on you. Okay, walk forward a little, like two steps forward. Turn to your right. <laughs> Excellent. So just stay there because it's a bit too easy. So what I want everybody else to do is just to start talking. Talk to your neighbour. If you don't know what to say, say rhubarb, rhubarb, custard, mission scientists, whatever. <laughs> well, just talk. If you want to sing a song, sing a song. Um, if you want to pray for Grace's safety, then do that. But I just need you to be making some noise. Carry on. So you're like, okay. <laughs> La 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 Like they are Papa Papa I don't know why I'm singing Abba Okay we'll take that Thank you very much Thank you so much Quick question. <laughs> Your face, what am I doing over there? <laughs> 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 um, what, just quickly, what, what does that feel like? It's really weird. Go on, give me a bit more than weird. Drill down into that. At first, when there wasn't any noise, it was easier <coughs> to concentrate on moving, and I felt like I had more sense of where I was. But once all the noise started, it was harder to pick out what someone was saying to me. And I couldn't really hear what they were saying. And I'm thinking, did they say something? Did they not say something? How that leave, supposed to have done something How'd that now? leave you feeling? I was a bit lost. I was like, should I move? Should I just move anyway? Because you think you've heard something. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't really too sure what to do. Thank you very much. So imagine the emotions that go with that feeling of lostness. From the moment a sonographer or somebody says, I'm sorry, that's the world we enter. That's the baked bean puzzle. To some extent, we never truly come out of that place. And I need you, in fact, if you put your hands over your ears right now, just put your hands over your ears while I'm talking, uh, and it's a bit muffled, it doesn't sound quite right, you can stop now. When you are talking to someone who has just lost a child, that's the place they're in. Nothing you say is going to be taken in the way that you think it's going to be taken because the people hearing you no longer hear the way they did five minutes previously. 
we're in a different place. You may need to oversimplify. You may need to take your time. You may need to repeat because we are not who we were five minutes earlier. And our brains are rewiring at that moment. We're doing baked bean puzzles. Um, I love comics. I love comics. This is Animal Man. Um, I love Animal Man. He's a man with animal powers. Uh, gave it away. Um, uh, and it was, it was an old character that was shit. And this guy called Grant Morrison came and made him really good. And what I really liked about him was that he was balancing saving the world with his family life. It was the first comic about a superhero's family life. He had a wife, he had two kids, he had pets, all the rest of it. And uh, shortly after Grace died, um, after her funeral, actually, I wanted something normal. I wanted something comfortable. I went to a comic shop, went, oh, Animal Man's back. Never knew he was back. I grabbed a comic, I got home, made myself a cup of tea, Mr. Kipling's apple pie. Um, and um, which, funnily enough, I'm not as good as Sainsbury's Owens apple pie. Just, um, uh, did that, sat down with the comic, opened it up to this page to realize it was the day of Animal Man's son's funeral. Once upon a time, I'd have looked at that and gone, the art is incredibly evocative of the human condition and blah, blah, blah. And that was the day I realised every little thing in my life had changed. I could no longer just open a comic or a book and read it the way I used to. I looked at it now and I thought, I recognise his hands trying to grip nothing. Wanted to hold something and there's nothing there. I recognise that pain that you don't know how to utter. I recognise the isolation that they are feeling, together but apart. Everything changes. A lot of what I do in my talks is try to understand, is try to get people to understand how far-reaching the effects of uh, still of losing a child is. I also don't like this. Is I often think I could just show this picture and sit down, actually, because it says it says everything. I also hate the term baby loss, even though my own sort of charity says exploring life after baby loss because I know exactly where my baby is. I didn't lose her. She died. And I need people to understand that she died because they, it's taken a lot to get society to take our grief seriously. Because it's what miscarriage, stillbirth, it's one of those things. It's not one of those things, it's death. And I need people to take my grief seriously. I try to use death as much as possible. I'm not going to go on about memory making because um, we've talked a lot about it, but it become, you are the gatekeepers of our memory making. So it kind of becomes your responsibility, all that spare time you've got to work out what is online, what is in your area. Uh, a place to start may be, um, just Google the Butterfly Awards. And the reason for that is it's award ceremony for people who've been where we are um, and for the organisations that support them. And a lot of uh, resource organisations get nominated for stuff. So it might be a good place to see, to get ideas for what's out there. Bye. That's all right. Life's too short to be sorry. Um, yeah, so back to Am I Allowed? Um, our child's died and they come in and they give the, uh, whatever it is they give for lactation suppression. And against again, my wife doesn't say, am I allowed not to take it? She just says, no, I'm not going to take it. And she went on over a three month <coughs> period to express uh, 20 litres of breast milk for premature babies. It was incredibly hard not to be able to give what was meant for our child. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> um, no, we were talking earlier. <laughs> um, that's, that's, it's just like, yeah, my wife's not here. <laughs> um, it's incredibly difficult uh, to express that which was meant for your child and not to be able to give it to your child that's incredibly cathartic to know that it's going to nurture the lives of others and don't dare anybody take that choice away from us because of omission or ignorance of the fact that this is a possibility and that there are milk banks out there don't you dare um yeah our, our, our maternity journey is punctuated by my wife kind of educating medical professionals um don't put yourself in a position where you have to be educated, like on, on the simple stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, question. What do you see there? 
Yes, but no. <laughs> Sorry? Skin to skin, yes, but no. There are two answers I'm looking for. No, because you might get the right one. <laughs> Go on then. He sees a black man holding his baby. The other correct answer was a hot man holding his baby. <laughs> um, no one ever seems to get that one either. <laughs> it's like, no. Ah, well. Um, now, the reason I talk about, uh, and it's really weird, that no one ever, ever gets, never picks up on the colour. Because often I think I get a lot of people, um, white people, uh, going, I don't see colour. And I'm like, well, that's nonsense. If you didn't see colour, we'd all be walking around dressed as clowns. <laughs> Everybody sees colour. Colour's important. Saying I don't see colour is not actually a helpful statement. Uh, because differences come with colour, not, not differences in equality, but differences in stuff. Um, and the main difference that comes, and it's not one that affects me as a man, is this. When compared to babies, of, and this is, we've look, we talked about the stats before, and now I'm talking about the probabilities. When compared to babies of white ethnicity, black, black British babies have 121% increased risk for stillbirth and 50% increased risk for neonatal death. Asian, Asian British babies have a 66% increased risk of neonatal mortality. This was brought to light in a study from <coughs> Embrace, the Embrace people uh, last year. The reason they emphasised this was because they said in all their work they kept seeing this stat pop up. It's not a new stat. And they suddenly went, why is no one talking about it? It doesn't matter what population this affects. If this stats exist for any population, it should be being talked about. And no one is. And they didn't do anything about it, but at least they highlighted it. The recent stats have come out and actually showed that things are actually far worse uh, than they are. The Office of National Statistics have recently released that um, uh, stillbirths are now down to 14 a day. I think uh, when Chris and I, when Henry and Grace died, and one of the things I love about sharing space uh, with Chris is that uh, the day our connection was made was when we were sat across the table from each other at the Butterfly Wards and realised that our babies died within three hours of each other at different ends of the country. Immediate bond. Um, uh, I forgot what my point was. Got caught up in that. Um, That's just really... Um... Fourteen babies a day. So I think when our children died, it was 17 a day. It was 17 a day, five and a half years ago. It's now down to 14 a day. And that's an incredible statistic, but not incredible enough. What the latest Embrace stats are showing is that while rates of stillbirth are dropping in white babies, they are dropping twice as fast as they're dropping in black and Asian babies. People always ask me, why is that happening? The first question is there, is it genetic <laughs> factors? And I say, I understand the question, but it is somewhat disingenuous to put the blame for children dying back on the mothers. Um, especially when you consider that in America, the stats are the same, or, or give or take, for African-American women, Latino women, and uh, Native American women. What we're examining there are women who are racially at the bottom end of, of the pecking order. If that doesn't suggest a correlation to you, they need to open your eyes. I am not going to stand here, uh, and also when you consider the amount of uh, the figures for uh, black women dying in maternity in general, um, I am not going to stand here <coughs> and say you're racist. I'm not going to do that. <coughs> what I am going to do is ask you to examine your structural base. Uh, ba biases. It is impossible to grow up in a majority white country without having some sort of unconscious bias. I have had to examine my own biases and I was quite stunned by them as a black man towards black people. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, of course I have those biases because I have grown up in a white society bombarded with the messages since I was, since I was young enough to know. It took me till I was eight years old and I went home to my mother and said, I wish I was white, for her to sit down and instill a sense of black pride in me. If that's happening to me as a black person growing up in a black family, there is no way that you are not exempt from certain biases you do not even realise you have. 
if it makes you uncomfortable or you feel defensive, I literally don't have time for your fragility because people and babies are dying. Um, so think about it. If it's uncomfortable, it kind of has to be. But thank you for taking the time to consider thinking about it. That's interesting. <laughs> um, okay, is that the time? Okay, I'm going to hurry. Do you mind if we go over a little bit? Are we allowed to stay five minutes over? Five minutes over? Ten minutes? Fifteen? Um, <laughs> So the Big Bang, the, so people often think about stillbirth or baby loss as an event. It happens, <laughs> bang, you get over it, you recover, you do whatever you need to do. But it's a lot like the Big Bang. The Big Bang, woo, was an, yeah, right. Um, the Big Bang was an event and it's just like, <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. Did you go to a dirty place? You know, you're like, how dramatic you are. <laughs> <laughs> I know you really well. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, Big Bang happened. It was an event. It was just an event. But what came with that was it created so much more. It created stars, constellations, galaxies, meteorites, planets, suns, all the rest of it. It wasn't just an event. Things were born with it. So, whoa. <coughs> um, when you lose a child, many things are born with them. I'm going to rush through them. And I've renamed a few of the constellations. Fear, guilt, PTSD, previous issues are great names for stars. And um, basically... Uh, someone said, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, it's a very natural reaction to trauma. If it's natural, why are we calling it a disorder? <laughs> it's post-traumatic stress. Anyway, but one of the things uh, I found really interesting was that one, the second biggest one uh, was combat exposure for men, apparently. I don't know why it's not for women who are in combat. But, um, uh, I mean, that doesn't really make sense because we know that PTSD is about a complex of stuff. But at the Butterfly Awards, I won an award for inspiration for father in 2015. I gave a speech and afterwards this guy came up to me and he just stood there and he looked at me and his eyes were red and he didn't say a word. And he looked at me and I looked at him and somewhere someone went... Doo -doo -doo, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we looked at each other and then he just... I went, hello. I didn't do that because I'm not naturally that deep. <laughs> um, I went, hello. And um, he just lunged forward and he grabbed me and he held me really tight. And my first thought was, he's really fit. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, hold it in. It's like, you know. Um, and he said, I'm a soldier. I've served in Afghan and I've held my friends in my arms as they've died. And I couldn't deal with what you're going through. And that was the first time I realised maybe it's not a stress to call this trauma. What comes with that is guilt. I started off going on about my amazing sexual prowess, but part of the reason I did that was to go, what if it was because of the sex? You start to second guess every little thing you did on that pregnancy journey. I didn't tell you what happened. When we looked at the cord, it became obvious that the, uh, after the waters broke, the epithelium of the sac wrapped itself around the cord and cut off the blood supply, which never happens. Um, there are no stats online for it. It was the freakiest of freakiest accident. And one of the reasons that I had then had trouble with sex, because I'm, like, I'm trying to find a reason. Maybe it was the sex. Maybe it was this. Maybe it was that. And afterwards, at a time when I think what happens to a lot of women is uh, the way that guilt affects a woman is you look at your body and go, this is body of a woman that's meant to do womanly things, and it failed in even that. I am a failure. I can't do this. I can't do that. And that guilt lies to you and follows you around. And, um, uh, and you need to combat that. Uh, but at a time when my wife needed to feel like a woman, when she needed intimacy and, and, and attention, I couldn't perform because the guilt had robbed me of that ability. Um, as I said, PTSD is a, is, is a complex of all your issues. So when you're trying to sort out your baby loss, your baby death grief, it's really hard because your PTSD is actually taking all your other issues and chuck them into the mix. Try to extricate all of that. It's not a simple journey. And you maybe get six weeks with a baby loss counsellor. Great. 
that will sort me out. Um, uh, and of course, you've got the fear there as well of what, will ha of, of what could possibly happen. The most interesting, though, is the epigenetic changes. And epigenetic change means that when you hit trauma, your brain chemistry, your <coughs> chromosomal makeup literally changes. It's not that you feel different, it is that you are genuinely different. My wife and I leave in the hospital, hand in hand, looking around. We're both going like this, and we both go, what? The colours are different. The colours were different. It wasn't the colours were different. We had changed in such a dramatic way. It affected the way we physically saw the world. We are literally different people. The other thing that happens, uh, P and D. What's that stand for? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, dealing, with the, we're dealing with the fourth trimester is hard enough when you've got a baby. And we all know, and I think the general public who've never had babies kind of don't seem to realise that there is a whole lot of shit still going on with the body after you've had a baby for a while. And we know that the second biggest killer in maternity is suicide. And how many suicides happen in the fourth trimester? And I don't think there are any stats that correlate the, death, the suicidal deaths of women with stillbirths in the fourth trimester. But the reason it's on my radar is that a woman we met at the Butterfly Awards last year killed herself because she couldn't live without her, her, her baby. Male confusion. They, well, apparently that's the natural state of being, uh, <laughs> apparently. Um, uh, uh, I've had the privilege to, know, to watch a lot of men come into terms with their emotions because what we get as men is that you know, we're brought up to be, <laughs> we're rocks, I'm going to support my women but I'm not showing any emotion. I'll become emotionally unavailable and not shedding a tear. I am a rock. I am an island. Problem is, we're actually volcanoes, and if we don't vent, we will explode. Um, for me, uh, there's, a, there's a group called Daddies with Angels, and they did a little survey on their site. It's not scientific, but it was a survey of their members. And what they found <laughs> is that 80% of their members thought they had stable mental health before a loss. 80% uh, thought their mental health declined after a loss, 46.5% had suicidal thoughts following a loss, 11% attempted suicide following a loss, and 21% self-harmed following a loss. So how does it work out being a rock now? 70, the figures show us that 75% of the people who commit suicide are male. So while we are expecting men to be rocks, why we are expecting that of ourselves, it's causing problems. I chose to express that by digging my daughter's own grave. I didn't wait to ask if I was allowed. I said to the people, I am going to dig my daughter's final resting place with my own hands. I want to go home aching. I want to go home with calluses. I want to get as close as I can to the physical feeling that my wife went through. I know I can't, but I need to do something. And that's part of the reason my wife didn't want any more pain relief than she had, because giving birth and the pain that came with that <coughs> was something she could do for her child, because there's nothing else she can do now. Um, siblings, we brought our, our, our daughter was three, she wasn't stupid, she knew she had, a, she had a sister, so we brought her to meet her. We couldn't use stupid phrases like, oh, she's sleeping, she's not sleeping, she's dead. How do you explain death to a three-year-old when you're struggling to explore it yourself? I don't know, but somehow we did. And she's got her own particular grief journey, um, which has been hard, but it's been quite funny, actually, along the way. We did the Wave of Light, which is a, it was a march we did with our local group to commemorate dead babies around the world. And there's a big lake there, and she's walking along singing about a monster that came out of the lake and ate all the dead babies. And you're like, <laughs> like wow! Keep it down, love, keep it down! <laughs> Yeah, that was good. Um, but one of the benefits of um, involving her in everything is this. The next time you had a baby, she was there. Like, you know, every time she had a contraction, she was there doing that. It was fantastic. It was lovely. Um, relationships, I'm not going to talk about that except to say I do not know a single person in my position who hasn't lost friends or family because they can't deal with the shift that happens in you um, when, when you hit a trauma. Uh, subsequent pregnancies, we've talked about them. That's Alyssa. She was, uh, Siobhan went into labour on the 4th of May, which is Star Wars Day. And I had to say, no pressure, hun, you've got 24 hours. <laughs> and 24 and a half hours later, <laughs> on International Day of the Midwife, uh, Alyssa was born. Look at that. That's, that's a water birth, that is. She literally didn't know she'd been born for ages. It was beautiful. Um, but it's... With my, in our case, almost 10 months of hell 
waking up every morning wondering if your baby was going to die today. It's a tough rainbow journey. Um, really quickly, this is Bernie. He's the bloke. And he says, I got, he's, and the woman on the left is death. And she's doing her rounds. And this comic called The Sandman, you get to see her doing her rounds. He's been given special dispensation. I got what, 15,000 years? That's pretty good. I lived a pretty long time. You lived what anybody gets, Bernie. You've got a lifetime. No more, no less. You've got a lifetime. This is the lie that we also tell ourselves that we never got a chance to know our children. We did. Not for as long as we wanted not in the way we wanted, but they had a life, the only life they will ever know. We like to call it womb life. And they lived that. And it's important for us to leave hospital acknowledging that we gave them everything we could and that those women who are feeling guilty, we need to combat that because it wasn't their fault. A confluence of events <laughs> beyond their control uh, uh, led up to the death of their child and they did everything they could. And that's the definition of a hero. And we need to combat that guilt and everything, that every lie that it tells uh, to us. Our children stay with us forever. I've heard of a woman who spoke about her stillbirth first at, um, on her deathbed, 80 years previously. Never spoken about it out loud before, but remembered everything. They never leave us, and if you expect them to, sod <laughs> Do I dare? Have I caught? Okay. Just one. I wrote a poem. <coughs> bye bye. One day, in case I forget. It's called cool I Pause. There was a pause, then a breath. We drove in our car. The hospital wasn't far, but my breathing was shallow and labored. In my head, I was hoping we soon would be laughing because my daughter was hopping, trying to avoid the Doppler. Then the lady, she scanned us, and the words she was speaking, which were apparently English, suddenly made sense in my head. I'm sorry, she said. A pause. Then I breathe. It's the only way to relieve this pressure that's bending my chest and punching my brain. My wife's eyes are tearing as grief is searing apart to her soul, and I'm no longer whole because of my grace shaped hole. Eyes that I'll never see, a smile that'll never be, friends that'll never come round, and you say I have to lay her in the ground? Grace. I will say it. That's my daughter's name and I'll own it and shout it out loud and I need you to know I have said to my friends that my girl wasn't stillborn, she died. And I'm sorry if talking like this ain't a hit, but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And I pause. And I breathe. I'm not ashamed of my dead child whose grave I dug and created and neither should you of your dear beloved for they lived for a while and we were elated before their bodies were laid in a tomb they had life in a womb incubated. So I celebrate her life and grieve for her death. I take a drink from my cup. Wait, my one week is up? You, you want me back working? You think I've been shirking when I don't even know who I am? So I pause and I breathe to shout, she was real, to uplift my screaming brothers and sisters. We are parents, no doubt, and it needs to be said that the time for the silence has shifted. And the MPs sat and debated, yes, brave parents spoke, but has my anger abated? Because so many seats there were empty, like my heart when my daughter left me. So screw the taboo. Let's stand up with pride. Tell the world of our grief. 
depression and guilt. I'm giving you notice because my eyes are sparkling again. And it's time doctors woke up and the public got broke up because I ain't living in silence no more. See, the quiet inside is too loud to contain. I have to do something. I just can't refrain. So I pause and I breathe. If my continued oration makes you want to sigh, then remember that over 2,000 babies a year didn't have to die. So for all those grieving whose pain I lift up high, get ready, because here comes my battle cry. I am a parent. Just like my daughter, I pause. And unlike my daughter, I breathe. I pause and I breathe. I pause and I breathe. Thank you so much for your time.